All right, good evening, everyone. Lashana Tova uh, to everyone as New Year's coming up. I'm Melanie Hughes. I am the treasurer of the Louisville chapter of Hadassah, although like 100% of our offers, officers live in Hoosierville, not Louisville, I will say, but it's for the region of Kentuckiana. Um, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction to Hadassah. So, Bereshit, in the beginning, one woman connects with another woman and a Hadassah group is born. And so it is that everything starts with one. A beautiful garden starts with one seed. A symphony starts with one note. A painting starts with one drop of paint. And a building starts with one brick. And a dream starts with one woman. Hadassah was founded by Henrietta Zold more than 100 years ago and exemplifies how one woman's dream, one woman's vision, can grow into a powerful force of over 275,000 American women dedicated to growth and security of the state of Israel. And um, many of you may know about Hadassah for its hospitals and medical facilities in, uh, in Israel, but it's really about a whole lot more. I am a baby Hadassah member. I just joined earlier this year. I know some of you all are probably like, how many of you in here have, are members of Hadassah right now? Okay. How many of you, your mothers or your grandmothers or your great grandmothers are members of Hadassah? So it's definitely a Lador Vador um, organization. I am the only Jew in my family and I converted to Judaism, so it's, it's new for me. Um, but there's something in Hadassah for everyone. Um, as I went to my first event up in Chicago for the Midwest chapter this year, they were showing um, pictures of the youth villages and I was like, wait a second, I've been there. I'd actually stayed with, if anyone knows Lior Ben Shalom, who grew up in the south in the Negev, I'd actually stayed at the youth village because her uh, father's now retired, but he worked and helped take care of animals up at um, the Hadassah youth village that's near uh, Zikron Yaakov. And I was like, wait, I've been there. And I'm a li librarian at IU Southeast, and I was like, I wonder what I could do to like help the schools. And so that's probably gonna be my personal project is to work to help uh, get children's literature to places and um, help support Israel in that way. So that's my personal plan, but there's, Michelle has gone in medical missions, which you may have heard her speak about since she's a member here. I'm a member at Adath Jashurin. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. And if you haven't been involved yet, get on board and we're welcome to programming ideas that you all might have in the community. So without, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the temple for hosting us. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to introduce our keynote speaker who's traveled to join us and have a great conversation with us. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Yes, Shana Tova. Um, okay. Basim Eid is a Jerusalem-based political analyst, human rights pioneer, and expert commentator on Arab and Palestinian affairs. Basim Eid was born in the Jordanian-occupied Old City in East Jerusalem, whose place of residence became the United Nations Refugee Works Agency, un UNRWA, uh, refugee camp of Shuafat. He rose to prominence during the first intifada, the Palestinian uprising, and was a senior re field researcher for B'Tselem, the Israel Information Center for Human Rights in the occupied territories. In 1996, he founded the Jerusalem-based Palestinian Human Rights Monitoring Group. In 2016, Eid assumed the role of chairman of the Center for Near East Policy Research. Basim Eid publicly condemned the widespread murder of Palestinian dissidents, often for reasons unrelated to the intifada. In 1995, following his report about the Palestinian Preventive Security Service, he came under attack by some Palestinian leaders for revealing human rights violations committed by the Palestinian Authority. Arrested by Arafat's Presidential Guard, Force 17, he was released after 25 hours following widespread international condemnation. Basamid has spent 26 years researching UNRWA policies and has written extensively on the subject of UNRWA reform and is an outspoken critic of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. 
Um, Mr. Reed's going to talk for an amount of time, and then we'll have some question and answers, and I will run with the microphone. So afterwards, we'll have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know whether to say uh, good afternoon or good evening. Yeah. I would like to thank, first of all, uh, each of you for attending this uh, event and to, to thank Hadassah uh, for uh, the invitation and to thank Rabbi David and the Timbel for hosting uh, this event. Uh, first of all, I want to say also Shana Tova to everyone. And let's hope that the coming year will be better than the current one. On the other side, I am personally very familiar with Hadassah Hospital. My father worked in Hadassah Hospital for 40 years. So I know a lot of people over there in Hadassah and we used also to have our own medical treatment in Hadassah Hospital. As you might know, this uh, evening we are going to talk about the internal Palestinian politics and conflicts. As you might know, we the Palestinians have conflicts everywhere, not only with Israel. Unfortunately, since a month ago, a big fight took place in one of the refugee camps in Lebanon called Ain al-Hilwa refugee camp. Two Palestinian political parties are killing each other over there. And God knows what the situation of the, of the civilians who are living in that camp. And just yesterday I put an article about what's going on in Ain al-Hilwa. And I am asking, where are those, the pro-Palestinian organizations? We didn't hear even one word from them about what's going on in, uh, in Lebanon and mainly in Ain al-Hilwa uh, refugee camp. But looks like that those pro-Palestinians are trying to take a nap until Israel involved, and then everyone will wake up and start talking about what's going on. So my article yesterday in the Times of Israel was about the SJP. Where are you? Wake up and give a word about what's going on to the Palestinian civilians in that refugee camp. Now, <clears throat> this year, unfortunately, considered one of the most a bloody year between the Israelis and the Palestinians. A very high number of Palestinians and Israelis has been killed. And no doubt that the Iranians are trying to move faster and faster towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right now, the Iranians became neighbors. They are sitting on the Israeli-Syrian border and looks like that it's much easier for them to operate via their agents, which is the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. And this is one of the major problems right now, that the Hamas almost succeed to reoccupy some different places inside the West Bank itself, and mainly the refugee camps. You know, the refugee camps people all the time, they are suffering from poverty. And that's exactly what the Hamas is looking for. Coming to those people, a lot of money Iran is spreading on the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad terror, and looks like that they succeed right now to put on missions so many young Palestinians either to commit suicide or to stab or to run by their cars over the Israeli civilians. And we noticed what's really going on in the past few months. 
The Palestinian Authority in the West Bank became like a handicapped body. They couldn't function. And when the Israelis asked them, why you are not functioning? Then they said, we are suffering from a lack of finance. When the Americans asking them, why you are not functioning? We are suffering from a lack of military equipment. But if the Palestinian Authority will receive the finance that they want and the military equipment that they want, will they be able to operate? I don't think so. I don't think so. You couldn't believe that right now in the West Bank, we have around 250,000 security members. And the all inhabitants of the West Bank is less than 2 million. So quarter million are security forces members. But those security forces members, no one of them can allow to himself to enter to Jenin refugee camp. They know if they will enter, they will be killed over there by their brothers, by the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. And the Palestinian Authority right now is in a big dilemma what exactly they should have to do. No doubt that the Israeli government start right now to find ways how to strengthen the Palestinian Authority. The Americans also trying to send some military equipment to the Palestinian Authority. I hear that two days ago, the Americans tried to send some small tanks through Jordan to the Palestinian Authority. And right now, there is a big catastrophe within the Israeli government because Ben Gvir and Smotrich said that such kind of equipment should have to be agreed in the cabinet. And Netanyahu never ever call us for a cabinet to deal with such kind of things if we, are, if we are allowed to give it to the Palestinian Authority or not. So we are moving, you know, from catastrophe to another catastrophe, from one conflict to another conflict, and God knows what is the coming conflict is going to be about. Now, the Palestinians, in my opinion, has no, no kind of strategy towards any kind of a future peace with Israel. I don't believe that Mahmoud Abbas want to reach any kind of peace with Israel. We are talking about a leader who is almost 87 years old. He's so tired, he couldn't think about tomorrow. He preferred to think about the 48 war and the other wars which took place between Israel and the, and the Arabs and the Palestinians. But to think about the future of the children of the Palestinians, I think that he is completely unable. Now the question is, what will happen if Abbas will pass away? That's the biggest question that everyone asking himself. I used to say that with, with Abbas, it's a problem, but without Abbas, it might be a tragedy. Because as you might know, each member of Fatah want to be a president. And I believe that a huge catastrophe will take place among the Fatah party after Abbas will die. And I believe that some assassinations it probably will take place in the West Bank and it probably Israel should have to interfere in terms in term to keep the Palestinian street under order. No one knows who is the one who is going to replace Abbas. There are some rumors that X, Y, and Z, but X, Y, and Z are not really so popular among the Palestinians, and they don't think that they have the chance to be the replacement of Abbas. If we will talk about the Arabs, you know, in the past, 
we the Palestinians used to say, if Israel will solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, 54 Arab and Muslim countries will make peace with Israel. This is what we used to say years ago. But these days, looks like that the half of the 54 Arab and Muslim countries almost has a relationship with Israel, while the Palestinian conflict never ever solved. Which means that the Arabs are really, and the Muslim countries, are really not so care anymore about the Palestinians. And each country right now trying to look after its own interests. And this is leading us to the last three years when the Abrahams Accord came out. Why three Arab countries signed normalization with Israel, United Arab Emirates, the Kingdom of Bahrain, and the Kingdom of Morocco. Right now, we are talking about Saudi Arabia, which I believe within a very short period, the normalization is going to be signed between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And if Saudi Arabia will sign the normalization with Israel, then the whole Muslim countries will start running towards Israel. I heard recently that Indonesia almost sent a delegation to Israel to talk about a future normalization with Israel. So where we are, the Palestinians? When the Palestinians are really going to wake up, I don't think that by practicing violence and practicing terror, I don't think that we are going to achieve anything from that. We almost terrorizing everything in the past, let's say, probably 23 years since September 2000. What we achieved from that? Just nothing. And why? Because the lack of a leadership. There is no leadership right now for the Palestinians. And I used to say that probably we, the Palestinians, need at least two or three generations in terms to be ripe enough for any kind of future peace between us and the Israelis. The Hamas right now is the one who is dancing on the blood. The Hamas is the one who has the popularity right now and have the money in the meantime. If we will look to the Gaza Strip these days, looks like that the Israelis are so satisfied from the operation of the Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Gaza looks like very quiet, and the Hamas is not really a planning for any kind of a new war, let's say, to impose it on Israel. And why? For a very simple reason. You know, since the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, in 2004, until two years ago, no one Palestinian Gazan allowed to enter to work in Israel. No one. From 2004 until two years ago. We remember that two years ago, the short five days war between the Islamic Jihad and Israel and how the Egyptians succeed to interfere and to achieve a kind of a ceasefire between Israel and the Islamic Jihad. After the ceasefire approached, the president of Egypt, Abdul Fattah Sisi, invited the Israeli prime minister in that time, Naftali Bennett. And Sisi told Naftali Bennett, that it is your responsibility right now to improve the economic situation of the Gaza Strip. Then Bennett said, okay, let me go back home and discuss the matter. 
he went, he met with his uh, ministers, and in that time, Benny Gantz used to be the Minister of Defense. Benny Gantz suggested in that time, let us issue 5,000 working permits to the Gazan workers. And they made it. Two months later, Benny Gantz decided to increase the number of the working permits to 10,000. Today, we have 20,000 Palestinian workers from Gaza entering every day, working in Israel and going back home. And this is the main reason why the Hamas is keeping so quiet on the Gaza Strip. Hamas don't want to sacrifice the 20,000 working permits. This is hundreds of millions of shekels every month coming as an income to the Gaza Strip. <coughs> but in the meantime, <coughs> the Hamas trying <coughs> to continue adding oil to the flame in the West Bank because they want to satisfy their own bosses who are sitting in Tehran. And Hamas couldn't get any money without any operation. You need to operate. You need to show your bosses that you are active and you are doing something here in terms to continue sending the money, the millions of dollars to you. And in the meantime, in my opinion, the Palestinians right now became really the hostages of their own leadership. We are between the, the hammer and the anvil. The hammer of Hamas and the anvil of the Palestinian Authority. If you will come today to any ordinary Palestinian and asking him what are the most three priorities that you are seeking, he will say a job to survive, to secure the education system and the health system for my children. Nobody is talking about settlements. Nobody is talking about the wall. Nobody is talking even about the foundation of the Palestinian state, which means that the majority of the Palestinians almost lost the trust in their own leadership. These are the facts from the ground. I am going around in the West Bank. I am living in Jericho, and I know exactly what people are talking about eh, 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 between themselves. Friends, we have today around 200,000 Palestinian workers entering to Israel from the West Bank only. 200,000 Palestinian workers entering to Israel every day, working and coming back. Beside the 200,000, we have another 30,000 Palestinian workers who are smuggling every day to inside Israel, working and coming back. 30,000 smuggling to inside Israel to work. Beside that, these numbers, we have around 15,000 Palestinian workers who are working in the settlements in the West Bank. So we are building the houses of the settlers, by the way, in the West Bank. We are. Because we want to survive. We want to secure the future of our children. We should have to do it. So we are never ever a try to boycott Israel. Beside the whole propaganda of the BDS here in the United States and in Europe, when they are standing up in their warm houses in Los Angeles, 
calling to boycott Israel. We are not. We don't even have any members of BDS, by the way, neither in the West Bank nor in the Gaza Strip. We don't have. Nobody in the, in the West Bank or in Gaza is calling to boycott Israel. Because before you come and say boycott Israel, you should have to find the alternative here. And nobody try to find the alternative right now. So while the situation is like that, I don't think that that's really giving any kind of hope towards any future peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the near future. We used to have a probably little bit hope that maybe the Abraham's Accord and those countries who signed the Abraham Accord Probably that accord will become wider and wider and more and more country will be involved in it. Maybe that's a probably will pave the way towards a kind of a future peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I am a person who believes that the Arab countries whom almost signed a kind of normalization with Israel, a probably will help the Palestinians, will be the bridge between the Palestinians and the Israelis, where the both sides can walk and meet each other and negotiate each other. Right now, everything is blocked. Everything is blocked. Now, on the other side, we can look to the Israeli current government. It's a sole rightist government. I don't think that the Israeli people are so happy to see Bitzalel Smotrich and Itamar Ben Gvir as ministers in the current uh, uh, government. And the demonstrators today in Israel who are demonstrating sometimes every day, sometimes every Shabbat, against the judicial reform. I don't think that they are really demonstrating against the judicial reform. I think that those Israelis are demonstrating against the whole government. And they would love to see tomorrow morning a new elections with a new government. Netanyahu right now in a big trouble, no doubt. Externally and internally. The relationship with the United States, it looks so bad. While the majority of the Israelis in the meantime are against the whole government right now. And Netanyahu trying to find ways how to recorrect his behavior and his attitude towards his own people. A lot of secret negotiations right now going on between the staff of Netanyahu and the staff of Benny Gantz. We know no one in Israel trusting Bibi Netanyahu, except his wife and his son. But on the other side, I think that Benny Gantz, in turn to reach any kind of agreement with Netanyahu, he is looking for witnesses. And the witnesses can be only a, probably the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, and the Americans. If the Americans and the President of Israel will interfere in the current negotiations between Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, I believe that tomorrow morning we will get a better government and we will see Ben Gvir 
and Smotrich that the police is running after them. This is what exactly the public opinion in Israel is seeking. And looks like, I believe, that the current government couldn't survive for four years. At all not. I can guarantee that. Changes should have to come out. And as soon as possible. There is a lot of pressure on Netanyahu himself, not only from the Americans, not only from the Europeans, but also from within, from the Israelis inside Israel. So let's hope that something better uh, probably will come out uh, through the changes of the current government. Now, if a new government will be formed in Israel, it doesn't mean that tomorrow morning they are going to sit with Abbas and to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the agenda of any coming government in Israel. It's not. Because Israel is not looking how to solve the conflict with the Palestinians. Israel is looking how to solve the conflict in global. In global. We want all the Arabs, we want all the Muslims to come together and to make peace with us. Then we can ensure our security from those people. So the Palestinians right now don't know exactly what they should have to do. We have a huge conflict between ourselves. We are completely a divided society. No one on earth can link today between Gaza and the West Bank or to bring any kind of unity between the Hamas and uh, the Fatah in the West Bank. We try so many times we reach many different agreements to be united, but unfortunately, everything almost failed. So while the Palestinians will continue being divided, I didn't see any opportunity for a future peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Looks like that each part won't its own delegation to negotiate with. Israel couldn't nominate one delegation to negotiate with the Palestinians. They need two, two staff of negotiators, one for the Hamas, one for Abbas. I used to say sometimes that those leaders who are talking about the two-state solution for two people looks like that they have a blind eyes. They didn't really see the realities on the ground. In my opinion, the Palestinian leadership is much more interested in a three-state solution for two people. Because the Hamas is defending their own Islamic Emirate in the Gaza Strip, Abbas is defending his own empire in the West Bank and the State of Israel. This is how we are living since the Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip in 2004. And looks like that everyone is so satisfied with his own. So that's it probably can be the solution. That's it probably can be the solution. Because if you will look to Israel today, Israel recognizing the Gaza Strip as a Palestinian state. The West is looking to Gaza Strip as a Palestinian state. Shimon Peres once said that the Palestinian state should have to be only in Gaza, not in the West Bank. And this is how we are really the Palestinians moving towards to be in Gaza. Gaza is the former e e Egyptian president 
the former uh, Egyptian president, once he decided to open a Gazan embassy in Cairo, Mohammed Morsi, to open a Gazan embassy in Cairo. What is this? In term to try to find a kind of reconciliation between the Fatah and the Hamas, he want to open a Gazan embassy in Cairo. So while the Arabs, unfortunately, are not giving their attention towards what is going on internally among the Palestinians, I don't believe that one day we will be able to find peace between ourselves. I would like to stop right now here and to open the floor for some questions. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. See, I, I'm not a person who has a lot of expectations uh, from the American administrations here. No. You know, each uh, elections in America, we used to become a little bit optimistic that maybe the coming American leader is really going to do something. We remember the days of Bill Clinton, we remember the days of, uh, of uh, 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 George Bush. We remember the days of Barack Obama. We remember the days of Trump. Now we have Biden. What those people really did, which is, by the way, I think that he probably the only one who did something, let's say, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was Donald Trump. No doubt about it. You can call him as a catastrophic person, yeah? But I think that he tried to move a little bit. Especially when he put out his plan, peace plan, that he called it the deal of the century. The deal of the century. Now, the deal of the century didn't ever mention Palestinian states at all not. But it's mentioned how to improve the Palestinian economy, economic prosperity. And I think that that's the point. That's the point. Economic prosperity. Without economic prosperity, we will never ever be able to pave the way towards any future peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And that's the plan that we really need. Unfortunately, in that time, the Palestinians almost rejected the deal. Because the Palestinians want a state. The Palestinians want a state. Wherever Abbas is going, he is saying, give me a state, give me a state. A state never ever been given. State should have to be built. And if we are looking to ourselves internally right now, which state we are talking about? A state which is in a lack of economy. A state which, which is in a lack of the infrastructure of a state. A state where is two-thirds of its population are living in refugee camps. Which kind of state is that? A state with refugee camps. We have 12 refugee camps in Gaza and we have seven refugee camps in the West Bank. How you can build a state 
with such kind of refugee camps. So I think that those, those leaders around the world who want to recognize the Palestinian state, we should have to tell them that the state must have to be built before it's recognized. And this is what the leaders don't want to understand. So the Americans, I am not a person, as I said, who has a lot of expectation from them. And I am a person who believes that this conflict must have to be solved only by two parties, the Israelis and the Palestinians, without sitting together, without negotiating each other, no one will be able around the world to impose peace on the Israelis and the Palestinians. Yeah. Yes. Um, what jobs are the Palestinians who are allowed into Israel allowed to do, and how strictly are they regulated? See, we 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 much more involved in the in. Uh, Can you repeat the question for us? Sorry. Which kind of jobs she asked that the Palestinians are uh, are practicing in Israel? Oh. Yeah, uh, mostly in in the in uh, let's say in in industrial areas. Uh, in Israel, there are a lot of industrial areas. And we have thousands of Palestinian workers who are uh, 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 working over there. Uh, mainly the construction. Uh, most of the Palestinian workers right now are uh, working in the construction uh, issue rather than anything else. We are not good in, uh, in agriculture, by the way. And Israel is trying to uh, import uh, uh, workers from Thailand. The Thai people looks like much more expert on agriculture than the Palestinians. So we are much more involved in the, in the constructions, in buildings, uh, rather than anything else, which is most of the, of the Palestinian workers are involved in the, in the construction and reconstruction. Yeah. Yes, please. You should have to take the mask so we can hear you. I'll stand up here so I'm not projecting. Yeah. Um, so my question, you know, I think that it's very interesting that you said that the solution that the, that the Israeli government is using is to increase the number of workers' permits. I don't think that's unlike U.S. strategy with Japan after World War II. When you become so economically inclined and entwined with another place, it's hard to fight. Mm -hmm. And I believe that peaceful people should be able to cross borders freely. Mm -hmm. So I think they should. I mean, what are your thoughts? Are they going to issue more work permits since it's so, been so successful? And then what are what are the objections or stopping uh, stopping Israel even from offering work permits to their refugee camps in Jordan too, right? Uh, no, not really, not really. Okay. Uh, recently, Israel agreed to uh, import some Jordanian workers to Elat from Aqaba. You know, Aqaba and Elat are so close to each other and I know that there are a couple of thousands of Jordanian workers who are coming every day from Aqaba, working in Ilat only, yeah, and going back. See, we, we have no other choice beside the working permits. Imagine, I used to say all the time, imagine if Israel will come one day by saying, we want to impose a boycott on the Palestinian workers. We don't want Palestinian workers. Let us take Gaza as an example. Gaza, since the Israeli withdrawal, no one worker is allowed to enter to Israel. Look what's happened in Gaza. It's what it, Gaza was about to explode because the lack of the economy inside the Gaza Strip. 
So I think that the 20,000 working permits that Israel issued to the Palestinian workers in Gaza almost saved the economy of Gaza. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Now, what is the other choice if Israel is not going to issue working permits? We couldn't move to outside Israel. No country in the world will accept the Palestinians. We have conflict with most of the Arab countries. Arab countries want to get, to get rid from the Palestinians since many years ago, many years ago. So what is the alternative here? Now, on the other side, when we talk about borders and we talk about, about uh, checkpoints here, yeah. listen, each country has the full right to protect its own security and its own people. Each country around the world. I used to say, if the Hamas in a week will shot 4,000 rockets towards Egypt, what Egypt will do to the Hamas and to the Gaza Strip, I believe in a few days they will trash it. They will erase it from the map. So you have action and interaction here. As the terror is spreading, as the terror is increasing, so more and more limitations are going to be imposed by the Israelis towards the Palestinians. We should have to agree on such kind of fact. I am a person who used to say all the time that while Israel will succeed to increase the Palestinian economy, it probably that will decrease the Palestinian violence. This is what I believe in. And I think that some ministers in the current Israeli government start talking about increasing the Palestinian economy. That's it probably will decrease the Palestinian violence. So these are the facts on the ground. This is the situation. Either you take it or you leave it. So you probably are aware of the division in this country. Um, and a lot of it perhaps has to do with the way that media is ingested in this country now. We used to have this guy, Walter Cronkite, and we all heard Walter Cronkite and had a news, one news source, right? And now, if you're left, you go to the left-leaning sites, and if you're right, you go to the right-leaning sites. My question is, how, what, how do people in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank consume information? Is it free uh, or is it very slanted one way or the other? Yeah. From Instagram and Facebook, uh, no doubt that the media almost lost the ethics of journalism. Media today, everybody, everybody knows, either it become pro-Israeli or it is pro-Palestinian. Now, to be pro-Israeli, this is not benefiting the Israelis. To be pro-Palestinian, that's when never ever benefiting the Palestinians. So I think that the Palestinians these days are not really paying so big attention to the media and what the media is saying and what the media is reporting. I think the majority of the Palestinians these days are lay on the social media much more than the media itself. And unfortunately, the social media is full of hatred and incitement and violence. And this is one of the major problems these days, in my opinion, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is the social media. I think that each country should have 
to control the social media. We should have, a, probably to have a kind of legislations how to avoid any kind of boasts which is calling for hatred or violence or, 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 or something like that. If you will take the Palestinian Authority as an example, they legislated a law called electronic crimes. Electronic crimes. So they are watching the social media. But the problem is that the Palestinian Authority with its legislation on the electro electronic crimes, they are still allowing people to continue posting boasts which is calling for violent and hatred. This is because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think that the Palestinians, by, by the way, much more active on the social media than the Israelis by boasting is such kind of boasts which is calling for violent and incitement and hatred. So this is the media that we are really taking, let's say, our news through is much more the social media. Nobody is watching the Fox News. No one is watching the CNN. No one is reading the New York Times at all not. Even the Palestinian, we have three Palestinian daily newspapers. You know, the biggest a newspaper in Jerusalem probably selling 5,000 copies for 4 million people in Gaza and in the West Bank. 5,000 copies. So people much more, you know, they have internet, everyone has his own smartphone, and they can, you know, without any limitation, go from the morning till the night to search and to see what is really going around the world. Yes, please. Uh, how important, or can you speak to the whole question of Israel's uh, wanting, I don't know if that's on, uh, to uh, take more land from the West Bank? You mean to annex? Settlement annexation. To annex. Yeah, how important is that? How do you put that into these equations? I, I don't think that Israel is really in favor to annex any parts of the West Bank. I don't think so. At all not. Because Israel knows very well that that will bring a huge political crisis between Israel and the international community. Now, we have in the West Bank three big settlements. One called Gush Atzion, one called uh, 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 Ariel, and uh, another one. Now, those settlements, they became like cities. They are not settlements anymore. They are cities. But if the negotiation will take place between the Israelis and the Palestinians, I believe that they can reach a kind of a solution for the status of those big settlements, which is suggested in that time by President Barack Obama when he talked about the swap, the swap, exchanging land. Israel, Ehud Olmert, I believe in 2006, he suggested that if we will annex those big settlements to Israel, we will compensate the Palestinians on a piece of land in the south of Israel to annex it to the Gaza Strip, mainly from Beersheba. So this is something which is going to be solved. The problem is that the negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis almost stopped for many, many, many years. So 
There is a kind of solution which is exchanging land. I will take this part, I will compensate you in the other part. Now, Israel knows that the Gaza Strip is so crowded place. It's a very small with a huge number of people over there. And the plan is how to annex some lands, probably from Israel and probably from Egypt. Egypt has a huge desert in Sinai. It's empty. Nothing there. Only terrorists are moving there. So it's much better to annex a specific space of land to the Gaza Strip. And that's, by the way, came out from the deal of the century, which is Donald Trump talk about. I read the deal very well, very carefully. He talked about it. How to annex part of the deserts of Sinai to the Gaza Strip and to make Gaza Strip much more bigger. So this is, this is the plan that I think that it's almost in the mind of each Palestinian and Israeli leader that the exchange of land is possible between the both sides. Yes. Yeah, last question probably. Yes, you mentioned uh, yes. you mentioned uh, Iran pouring money into there. You think that's good or bad? I think what? Iran. Iranian. Iranians pouring the money into into that region is that good or bad? It's, of course, it's bad. Of course, it's bad. Why the Iranians are not putting that money for their own people? Why they are sending it there? Because they want to spread terror. The Iranian money in the Middle East is only creating terror. It's not satisfying the people. It's not feeding the people. It's not bringing any medical aid to the people. It is just bringing terror. And that's the main aim of the Iranians, is how to increase the terror in the Middle East by providing such a huge amount of money every month. OK, great. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. And let us hope to meet again in a better situation. Thank you very much.